2 Samuel chapter 3. The Lord calls Samuel. That's where we're at right now. And so I'll read for you 2 Samuel chapter 3 and we'll get into it. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel, and he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and lay down, and the Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls again, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place, and the Lord came and stood, calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from the beginning to the end. And I will declare to him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay until morning, then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he said, here I am. And Eli said, what was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you, and more also, if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything, and hid nothing from him. And he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. And Samuel knew, or Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. What do we want to be known for? What do we want to be known for? What is our legacy When we say the name Wayne Gretzky, we associate him with being the best hockey player of all time. That's the legacy that he's left behind. Gretzky, hockey, that's hockey. Michael Jordan, basketball. What if we talked about others? You know, like Abraham Lincoln. We'd likely say, you know, what a hero. What a great president opposing slavery. Or we could go the other way to possibly the biggest villain in people's eyes in the last century who was Hitler, right? Who hated the Jews and caused millions to die. People are known for different things, but sometimes there's that one thing, that just that one thing that they're really famous for, whether that's good or bad. Like if you mention the name of the actor Leonard Nimoy, it's Spock, it's Spock from Star Trek, right? What other roles does he play? I don't know, but he's Spock. That's kind of his legacy. If we go on a smaller scale and we just think of our areas, we might hear things about different people like, oh, that guy's crazy. That guy's crazy. Or she is, she is so kind. People are known for their actions and how they treat others. And they're known by what their life looks like. If we were to think of one specific thing for ourselves that we would want to be known for, 
What would it be? What do we want our legacy to be? What do we want our identity to be? Do we want to be known for the things we own or our possessions or our style or our unique personality traits or our accomplishments? And I mean, we can be known for a lot of these different things, but in all of that, above all else, I want my identity to be in Christ. I want to be known as someone who knows Jesus. It's cool to think of the story of the writing on the wall in Babylon during King Belshazzar's feast when these fingers of a human hand appear and, and they write a message in an unknown language on the wall and that they call Daniel. They call in Daniel because he knew God. Daniel knew God. That's what he was known for. They knew God or a God had to have done this writing on the wall, right? And the queen mother told Belshazzar, there is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. Daniel's identity is that he knows God. And I love that. I absolutely love that. Unfortunately for Belshazzar, he dies that very night. He's murdered and his kingdom is taken over, as the message says, once it's interpreted. It was a harsh message that turned out to be true. But I just love, I love how they call in Daniel. Not just because he's this smart guy who knows languages. No, they call him in because he knew God. He knows God. I love how at the end of this first Samuel passage in verse 20, it says, and all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. That's what Samuel was known for, being a prophet of the Lord. His identity was in God Almighty, right? He was known for knowing God. And that's what we want to be above all else, right? Certainly for, for kindness or bravery or wisdom or a bunch of these different things. We want to be known for those things, I'm sure. But, but why? Because of God, because we know him, because we know Jesus. That's the influence of our actions. He's the cause for our kindness, the strength behind our bravery, the intelligence behind our wisdom. And if we're known as someone who is wise, someone who is fearless, someone who is kind. I hope people know that's because of the God that we serve. If we're loving or brave or wise, but people don't know the reason, they're missing out on knowing Jesus. We need to be telling people about him, right? We can't keep them in the dark about our Savior's love and kindness. We could be the best of people, but if they don't know why, that doesn't help them that much, right? It doesn't. Now, when we look at this chapter, this story of Samuel, where, you know, he listens to God, he hears from God, usually the lesson that we draw from it is something about listening to God, right? Which is good. We should listen to God. Although I don't know if I've ever met someone who God has audibly spoken to, not that I remember at least. So listening to God might not be as literal as it was here for Samuel. So don't, don't expect that, right? Don't say, oh, God didn't audibly talk to me. So I'm not really disobeying what he told me if I'm doing this or that, right? You have the word of God. You have the Bible, God's truth without error. I, I mean, in English translations, perhaps there are grammatical errors or stuff like that. Maybe throughout the, the transcripts throughout the ages, there were some numerical things that pop in here and there. But you have an account in the Bible that is 100% true. And also it's instructive. It shows you the heart of God. It shows you some of the things you should do. And it shows you some of the things you should not do. And I mean, there are some variables of that that apply to different peoples. And, you know, uh, some things that even, you know, the good guys do in the Bible that shouldn't be followed, right? But essentially, in the Bible, listen to what God says. 
Listen to what God says here. If you're a Christian, if you're a true believer in Christ, and you believe in what he did for you on the cross and in his resurrection, you have the Holy Spirit in you also who guides you. So if you read the word all about, you know, well, let's say the Great Commission, okay, and how the disciples spread the gospel and they went and told people about Jesus and what he's done, maybe one day you'll be sitting on a park bench, you know, eating a sandwich, I don't know, and someone you don't know will be sitting nearby and you'll all of a sudden feel this urge of like, you know, I should really talk to them. If everyone needs the gospel, why not them? And we get all these excuses in our heads because, you know, we don't feel like it or stuff like that or we're shy. But there's this urge of just like, you should do it. Maybe that's the Spirit prompting you from what you've read about in the Bible. That should be done. Listening, listening is easy <laughs> uh, if it's something that you want to do. But if it's something you don't want to do, of course, it's not easy. It might be not easy at all. It might be difficult. It might mean to push yourselves. In other countries, sometimes it means death. To live a life after Christ, to obey God. It's against our human nature. And there's such an opposition from the devil and his temptations and lies and the fear he instills that we shouldn't be fearful of. But it opposes our work right? There's a lot that opposes our Christian work. There's lots that opposes us keeping pure and holy. There's lots that opposes us from telling people about Jesus, but God is with us. And I know we can't physically see that, but there is a sense in we're going through life. He's right there when he asks us to do something saying, it's okay. I'm here with you. I'm here to help you. I will help you out. Now, there is an aspect of prayer that goes along with that. You know, ask for God's help. That's, that's important. But he is there. He's not going to leave you alone in what he instructs you to do. So listen to him. Listen to him. Uh, let's read some of 1 Samuel 3 now. Now, the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. So first of all, that's an amazing thing. He sleeps in the temple, the place where God dwelt, right? Where the ark of the covenant was, although surely it was still behind the veil. He's not, like, he's not going to be allowed into the Holy of Holies. But he is still in such a holy place, the temple of God. He was near to God. But the thing about the time is that God didn't really speak to his people. It was rare to hear from him. There was a man of God, that last chapter, came to Eli. But for the most part, God was silent. That would change with Samuel. Then the Lord God the Lord called Samuel, and he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli, and said, Here I am, for you called me. He thinks it's Eli. He thinks it's Eli calling him. But he said, I did not call. <laughs> Lie down again. So he went and lay down, and the Lord called again Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, my son. Lie down again. So now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. So Eli is not maybe the worst of people, but as we saw last week, he's not close to innocent either, right? He doesn't expel his sons from the priesthood for their evil. And he also partakes in the overindulgence of meat from the people's offerings, right? He takes along with his sons more than he, by the law of Moses, should. He's not a good priest, but he does have some wisdom. 
right? He realizes this is God speaking to Samuel. So he wants Samuel to answer the call and to listen to what God says. And Samuel does just that, and, and that's good. Unfortunately for Eli, though, the message from God, the message that God tells Samuel once he does answer the call, is once again a message against Eli and his house. And now Samuel knows it. And after hearing the message, Samuel lay until morning, and then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord, and Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli, right? It's a harsh word that was against Eli. God is going to punish Eli's house forever. God, in verse 14, says, Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house should not be atoned for by sacrifices or offerings forever, right? That's a harsh word, right? And Samuel is afraid of telling Eli. And when I think of us and our fears, it's kind of interesting, uh, you know, because we often have this fear of sharing the truth of God with other people. Sometimes people we don't know, sometimes even people that we do know. And we just don't want to make things awkward. We fear it. And I mean, you know, parts of the gospel message are in a way harsh, right? People go to hell. That's a harsh word. Even telling people that they're sinners is harsh to some people. And to some, even mentioning the name of Jesus sets people off, right? But to a disciple of Christ, like we are, you know, we're not one of the 12, but as followers of Jesus, that's the same thing as a disciple, we are Christ followers. A follower is a disciple. In Mark 16, verse 15, Jesus tells his disciples, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation, right? That's a command that applies to Jesus's followers, us, and a command that we too often seem to avoid. You know, we're so often anxious or nervous or frightened of what could be the outcome. What will they think of me? What if they get upset and feisty? What if they reject it? Jesus talks often about the world hating us. Matthew 10 verse 22, and you will be hated for my name's sake. Luke 22, blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. And John 15, 18, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. It's not a surprise that the world hates Jesus and his followers. But I think, too, often if you share the gospel with someone, like if you go and you tell them the truth about Jesus and how he died for their sin and, and rose again, and that if they choose to follow Jesus, believing in him and what he did for them, that they're saved from hell and allowed into heaven, that their sins are forgiven, however you choose to tell them that, it normally doesn't end in a tirade. Sure, it, it might, but so often that's not the case. Now, we see with Samuel here, with something way, way more harsh, right? No chance at atonement. Eli accepts it, right? Eli finally gets Samuel to tell him, and so Samuel does, and Eli accepts it, right? It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. No enmity against Samuel, no anger against him. Although, you know, we can't expect that every time when we go and share the gospel, right? There is opposition in the world. In the world, we will be hated. In the world, we will have hard times because we stand for Christ. Jesus says in John 16, 33, in the world, you will have tribulation. But take heart. I have overcome the world. And that's where you need to find your strength. You have Jesus. I struggle with sharing the gospel too. And there's not even a threat of being killed for my faith here like there is in other countries. What am I doing? I'm afraid of making people mad when there's eternal life at stake? It doesn't make sense. It really doesn't. But I still hold myself back at times when I shouldn't. And it's so common to do that in Christianity. But we have Jesus. Why should we be scared? We have no reason. 
No matter our fear, we should be following the words that Jesus, who is with us, gave us in the Bible. Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole of creation. That's why we're still on earth, so that the people here who don't know him would come to know him. We as the church are the light that shines Christ. We do acts of kindness to help the poor and, 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 and the needy and to show love and honor. But I hope that the reason why, I hope the reason why we do that doesn't go unnoticed. Doesn't go unnoticed. I hope people recognize our identity as Christians and that we do share with them that same hope that we have in Christ that has changed us. The reason behind why we do what we do. I hope that's not a secret. Finishing off chapter 3 here, verses 19 to 21. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. I love that. I love, love, love that. Let the Lord let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. Everything Samuel prophesied was true, and it came true. And that, that time, that time of God being silent, that ended with Samuel. He closed the time of God's word to the people being rare. He closed that time. Is it rare for the people here in the community or around where you live to hear the gospel? Is that rare? I encourage you to be a reason that it is not. The same encouragement, the same encouragement that I give myself. Show people love and share the reason behind it. Just like everyone from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord, let people know you for being established in Christ.